Good morning. Welcome, welcome to worship today. We're especially happy to have any guests who are here for the first time or have been here before. We're glad you're with us again today. Espe uh, give a special welcome to our uh, organist, uh, Michael Surratt, who is uh, substituting for Tim Spellbring today, and uh, thank him for his service here with us. A few announcements as we uh, uh, begin to our service and uh, this morning. Uh, after the service, we have in the great room a, a special presentation by uh, several uh, staff members of the Human Services Department of Mount Prospect. So it'd be a wonderful opportunity to, for all of us to learn about uh, what services are offered through this village. Uh, on Thursday, as part of the Boulder U program, uh, is Lunch and Learn at the Center, beginning at 11.30. The topic is Making Your Home Safe and Accessible. Uh, if you would like to attend, it would help to RSVP through the church office or on the web page. Uh, once again today, tickets are on sale for uh, St. Mark's celebration of 77 years of ministry, 65 years of the preschool, and 35 years of the PADS program. Uh, that Wonderful celebration will be on Saturday, October the 21st. So please uh, uh, purchase your ticket uh, if you have not already done so. Uh, directories are available on a table uh, in the narthex. Uh, if you did not get yours last week, uh, pick one up today and keep up to, to date on uh, who's living where and, and phone numbers and so forth. Yesterday was uh, Ageism Awareness Day. I bet not many of us were aware of that. So uh, just to remind us, that was yesterday. That was dedicated to shedding light on ageism. Ageism refers to stereotypes and prejudice and discrimination toward older people as well as to the very young uh, based on age. Uh, we're reminded of the Bible verse from Job chapter 12, wisdom is with the aged and understanding in length of days. And tomorrow, uh, we're, we're, this, we're on this 19th Sunday after Pentecost, but yesterday was Ageism Awareness Day. Tomorrow is federally recognized as Indigenous Peoples Day. Uh, in 2016, the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America made a commitment to begin the practice of land acknowledgments at all expressions of the church. So a land acknowledgement is a ritual intended to show gratitude to the land and acknowledge the original and indigenous peoples from whom the land was taken. Uh, the results of colonization are still part of our history that uh, we have to continue to address. So this is the land acknowledgement. The land on which we reside was stewarded for thousands of years before the incursion of Europeans who took the land for their own. We live, work, and worship on the land of the Dakota Sioux, Ho-Chunk Winnebago, Illini, Miami, Shawnee, Ottawa, Delaware, Kickapoo, Potawatomi, and Chickasaw peoples. Now let us listen to the prelude as we get our hearts and minds uh, centered on God.
to stand. Blessed be God, the one who forms us, Jesus who bears the cross, the Spirit who makes our joy complete. Amen. Amen. Let us bow before God in humility, confessing our sin. Steadfast and faithful God, you have revealed, revealed the ways, ways of justice, justice yet, we yet we fail to follow, to follow you. you. We are, are overwhelmed, overwhelmed by the, the world's, world's violence and, and suffering. We have for the sake of others, for the harm that we have caused, known and unknown, forgive us. For the just demands we place on others and your creation, forgive us. For the ways we turn away from your and our neighbor, forgive us. Lead us back to you and set us on the right path. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Beloved in Christ, God's justice stretches beyond all understanding. God's compassion is beyond compare. In Jesus, God is always making a new way for us. In Christ, you are already and always forgiven. Amen. Amen.
The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy for the peace from above and for our salvation. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy for the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Beloved God, from you come all things that are good. Lead us by the inspiration of your spirit to know those things that are right, and by your merciful guidance, help us to do them. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen.
children are, who are present may go to the great room for our children's church and to see some holy moly. first lesson is from Isaiah 5. Let me sing for my beloved, my love song concerning his vineyard. My beloved had a vineyard on a very fertile hill. He dug it and cleared it of stones and planted it with choice vines. He built a watchtower in the midst of it and hewed out a vine vat in it. He expected it to yield grapes, but it yielded wild grapes. And now, inhabitants of Jerusalem and people of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. What more was there to do in my vineyard that I have not done in it? When I expected it to yield grapes, why did it, not, why did it yield wild grapes? And now I will tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will remove its hedge, and it shall be devoured. I will break down its walls, and it shall be trampled down. I will make it a waste. It shall not be pruned or hoed, and it shall be overgrown with briars and thorns. I will also command the clouds that they rain no rain upon it. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel, and the people of Judah are his pleasant planting. He expected justice, but saw bloodshed, righteousness, but heard a cry. The word of the Lord. Second reading is from Philippians 3. If anyone else has reason to be confident in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day, a member of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew born of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. Yet whatever gains I had, these I have come to regard as loss because of Christ. More than that, I regard everything as loss because of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things, and regard them as rubbish, in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but one that comes through faith in Christ. The righteousness from God based on faith. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the sharing of his sufferings by becoming like him in his death. If somehow I may obtain the resurrection from the dead, 
Not that I have already obtained this or have already reached the goal, but I press on to make it my own, because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Beloved, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but this one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. I press on toward the goal for the prize of the heavenly call of God in Christ Jesus. The word of the Lord. Gospel according to Matthew, the 21st chapter. Glory, Glory to you, to you o, Lord. o Lord. Jesus said to the people, listen to another parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard, put a fence around it, dug a wine press in it, and built a watchtower. Then he leased it to tenants and went to another country. When the harvest time had come, he sent his slaves to the tenants to collect his produce. But the tenants seized his slaves and beat one, killed another, and stoned another. Again, he sent other slaves, more than the first, and they treated them in the same way. Finally, he sent his son, saying, they will respect my son. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to themselves, this is the heir. Come, let us kill him and get his inheritance. So they seized him, threw him out of the vineyard, and killed him. Now when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? They said to him, he will put those wretches to a miserable death and lease the vineyard to other tenants who will give him the produce at the harvest time. Jesus said to them, have you never read in the scriptures the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone? This was the Lord's doing, and it is amazing in our eyes. Therefore, I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken from you and given to a people that produces the fruits of the kingdom. The one who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces, and it will crush anyone on whom it falls. When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard his parables, they realized that he was speaking about them. They wanted to arrest him, but they feared the crowds because they regarded him as a prophet. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to, to you, you, O Christ. Christ. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Nonprofit organizations are facing tremendous headwinds these days. There's stiff competition for funding. There's the challenges of changing communication from paper communication to electronic and social media. There's the need to engage people in mission of an organization when people are very selective about what they will support. There's the expectation that the organization become more diverse, ethnically, racially, sexually, and age diverse. But behind so many of the challenges that nonprofit organizations and for-profit organizations face these days is the challenge of leadership. Where do we find good leaders? People who are, have a vision and yet are hands-on people who are good communicators and yet who can listen, people who are able to motivate others without becoming discouraged if the response is not what they would have hoped, people who are personally committed to the organization's mission and inspire others to be committed to it as well, and people who have thick skin because so people, other people are very critical these days. One indication that the church is trying to respond to these challenges, especially the challenge of leadership, came this summer when uh, the news was announced that the Lutheran School of Theology at Chicago 
uh, is establishing a chair, and that means a professorship, that will direct a new leadership initiative. The object objective for this will be to prepare participants to transform organizations and foster new ways of developing and managing people, improve efficiency, address issues facing organizations, and activate the people these organizations serve. Like so many organizations in the broader society, St. Mark is grappling with demands of leadership too. This is something that's no surprise to us. An obvious sign of that is uh, the fact that the, the pastoral role is vacant with the departure of Pastor Christie and Deacon David and the need to eventually call a new pastor. But we're also dealing with the need for lay leadership. Church leadership, lay and clergy, is harder today than it was in, uh, in the past because the culture is less supportive of the church than it was in an earlier time. And then we had this pandemic descend upon us that led many people to reassess whether they want to continue or resume leading. And at the same time as this challenge of leadership is in front of us, it's a very exciting time to lead the church because we have to try new ways of communicating, new ways of working ecumenically and on an interfaith basis, new ways of organi organizing ourselves, diversifying our leadership and membership to include people who are LGBTQ, older people as well as the young, and people of other races and nationalities who we may have overlooked or ignored. So it's an exciting time to be a leader in the church too. For the past uh, two weeks, we have been hearing parables about vineyards. And today's another occasion when we hear another parable about a vineyard. And the timing is perfect in terms of the church year. If you went shopping at the grocery store, you'll notice that grapes are plentiful. Harvest time is here. And in the church, uh, the church year is, end of the church year is also a time to think about harvest, God's final harvest of humanity. Two weeks ago, Deacon Pat Gerber preached about God's grace that awaits workers in the vineyard, no matter whether they're early in coming to work in the vineyard or late coming to work in the vineyard. And last Sunday, Pastor Jim Frank reminded us that God says to us, go and work in the vineyard, and he asked the question, what could we be doing in response to God's love? Now today's parable is a little bit different, but it's still about uh, the vineyard. It's about the stewardship of the tenants of the vineyard, those who leased or rented parts of a vineyard. Jesus inherited the whole uh, image, the metaphor of a vineyard, from the way the Hebrew scriptures speak about the people of God. In the first uh, reading for today from uh, the, the book of Isaiah, chapter 5, we heard the words, For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel, and the people of Judah are God's pleasant planting. And then we hear about God's disappointment with the fact that the vineyard, God's people, had not produced the way that God had expected. And then in the psalm, we ask God to behold and tend this vine, preserve what your right hand has planted. So yes, Jesus was drawing on this rich history of the vineyard uh, as representative of the people of God and the way they ought to respond to God. Now the tenants in the parable we just heard read were the religious leaders of Jesus' day. And I'm, this, these weren't just clergy, these weren't just priests, these were the laity as well. Pharisees were laity. The religious leaders of Jesus' day arrogantly thought that they were in charge of the mission. They were in charge of the, of the vineyard. And in many ways they were. They were the elite. They were the, the wealthy. They were the powerful. But they were arrogantly thinking about their role. So in this parable, the owner of the vineyard sends multiple representatives to collect the produce. In other words, get the money from the sale of the grapes. And each time the representatives came, they were rebuffed. 
And finally, the owner sends his son. And the tenants see this as an opportunity to take ownership of the vineyard. And so they kill the son. The tenants, the religious leaders, in other words, of Jesus' day, were failing in their stewardship. And so Jesus baits them into condemning their own tenancy. He asks, well, what will the owner do when he comes? And they answer, he will put those wretches to a miserable death and lease the vineyard to others who will give him the produce at the harvest time. The harvest, the harvest time. That has a double meaning here. It's the, there's the obvious meaning, well, when the grapes are ripe. But in Jesus' telling of this, it also has another meaning. And that other meaning is at the time when God comes to judge, at the end of days, at the inbreaking of the kingdom of God in its fullness, at the dawning of the new age, the time in which Christ is working and alive. The good leaders of his time, of, of Jesus' time, they should have anticipated change. Good leaders anticipate change. Good leaders are looking toward the future and not just focused on the present. But the religious leaders were not anticipating change. They liked things the way they were. They, they didn't see the cosmic changes that were afoot with Jesus in their midst. It was business as usual for them. They didn't want anyone to rock the boat. Now, at the end of this parable, Jesus injects a quote from Psalm 118. The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing, and it is amazing in our eyes. I have to, you know, this is a scripture reading that Jesus mixes the metaphors. You know, we're not supposed to do that, but Jesus mixes the metaphors. First, he's talking about a vineyard, and now he's talking about a building. But either with the vineyard or with the building, he's still talking about the people of God. And he's describing what will happen to him. Just a few days before he told this parable, it was Palm Sunday. He had come into Jerusalem to the people's hosannas. And now this is in the final week of his life. Within a few days of his telling of this parable, he'd be executed on a cross. But God would exalt him as Lord. So this quote about the rejected stone is referring to himself, his crucifixion, and his resurrection. He died for the disobedience of humanity, for your sins and for my sins, but God raised him on the third day in order to raise up a new people of God. Jesus will be the keystone, the cornerstone, the, the stone at the crown of the building that holds the, the other stones in place. He's the central stone of God's future temple, not made of literal stones, but of the new people of God, participate, participants in God's rule and reign. So Jesus says the kingdom of God will be taken from the current religious leaders and given to others who will produce the fruits of the kingdom. The keystone, the risen Christ, will be decisive in this. The one who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces, and it will crush anyone on whom it falls. And in the second reading for today, we, found, we hear about one who was broken to pieces by falling on this stone. Yes, none other than the Apostle Paul. One of the ilk of the religious leaders of Jesus' day, yeah, one of that crowd who had thought his stewardship included persecuting the people of God, but he was broken to pieces by falling on this stone, Jesus. On the Damascus Road, remember that story? Paul's traveling on the road and he's thrown off his horse by a vision and he says, who are you, Lord? And the Lord says, why are you kicking against the goads? Meaning, why, in other words, why do you keep tossing yourself against me, the keystone? 
Paul had been one of those powerful leaders with a sense of his religious superiority. But in the second reading, what we heard him say was, if anyone else has reason to be confident in the flesh, I have more. You hear that arrogance coming through? I have more. And he can lay it all out there. He gives the reasons why he was an elite member of the religious leadership. But after his encounter on the Damascus Road with the risen Christ, the keystone, Paul now says, I regard everything else as loss. Or as the text says, as rubbish, as garbage. Because of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. God had revealed to Paul a righteousness that comes not from obeying the law, but by faith. You know, most of what it takes to be a leader in the church can be learned. You can learn to make a plan. You can learn to create agendas. You can learn to conduct meetings. You can learn to budget. You can learn to pay bills on time. You can learn to invite others into leadership. But unlike all other nonprofits, as far as I'm aware, to be a church leader, you need to have received a gift that imparts a sense of humility in your leadership. And that's the gift of faith. Faith that Christ is our righteousness. Faith that the foundation and cornerstone for God's approval of us is Jesus. That's the credential you need to have to be a leader in the church, faith. And all of us have that. All of us were given that in our baptism. And from this faith, everything else follows. At least it, everything else followed for Paul, the apostle, and everything else follow, follows for church leaders today. Faith enables church leaders to press on and strive to what, toward what Paul calls the prize of the heavenly call of God in Christ Jesus. Leaders of organizations of all kinds press on. Every day, you know, you go to work and you see your bosses, or maybe you're one of them, pressing on, striving forward. For what? For prizes that are ultimately go away. Earthly, temporal prizes. But leaders in the church press on toward a prize that transcends earthly rewards. This prize is what we sing about in the offertory, we'll sing in just a minute, the, let the vineyards be fruitful, uh, uh, Lord. That's an offertory that's perfect for this season of the church year. And that, those words that, we'll, that we will sing in a moment say, speak about the hopes and dreams of all are gathered together in God's reconciling work in the world. In Jesus, God is restoring the world fulfilling the world's deepest longings, its hopes and its dreams. And God privileges us, lay people and clergy, to steward this amazing work. One thing that's very, very clear about this parable that Jesus tells us is that God does not throw in the towel. God does not call it quits. God changes approaches, yeah, that's true. He lays this keystone of a new people of God, but he doesn't quit. Sometimes we wonder about that because the last few years we've been wondering uh, with all this pandemic and its effects on the church, is God going out of the vineyard business? Given up on his mission in the world? Uh, my wife and I were just reading the latest issue of The Living Lutheran and there's a good article in there and I commend it to you about the burnout of congregational leaders and try to rejuvenate them after the pandemic. Uh, the pandemic wore a lot of us out, leaders in the church, and there's been a sense of grief over a loss of vibrancy and wondering whether the church will ever return to what it was. We don't have the answer to all those questions at this time, but there's also sadness over so much energy being put into things like maintaining buildings. There's a lot of questioning about having to do what we've always done. 
in this article, Pastor Phil Gustafson, who coaches congregations in the Grand Canyon Synod of our church, suggests that congregations take a hard look at the ministry that they are doing and that they may be having difficulty carrying on. And he says, maybe they should ask questions, is what we're doing honoring God? Is what we're doing building up the body of Christ? And if not, why are we doing it? We owe so much to those who have carried on over the past few years, members of the council and many others, who've tried to maintain life in the congregation. Thank you. Thank you to those who've been doing this. Thank you very much. I hope every time you draw, walk down the hallway and see the pictures of members of the council on the wall there, you s say a prayer to God and say, Dear God, thank you for these people. At the same time, we, we have to be intentional about praying God to raise up future leaders. And we have to take steps to nurture those future leaders. But God is faithful. God's not going out of the vineyard business. The words of our off offertory today are, let the vineyards be fruitful, Lord. Gather a harvest from the seeds that were sown. God will do this. In John chapter 15, Jesus takes the metaphor of a vineyard and he takes it in a totally different direction. Instead of the nation, the people of God being the vineyard, Jesus says, I am the vine. You are the branches. We are the branches. We can go forward in leadership. We can go forward in helping the church be the church in the world today by drawing our life from Christ. So drink deeply from his life for your life. Drink deeply at the altar, you leaders. Drink deeply from Christ, you current and future leaders. Drink deeply from this cup of blessing to be empowered to lead. For Christ is the vine and we are the branches. Amen. Now may the peace of God which passes all understanding keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus.
trusting in the transformative power of God's loving spirit, let us pray for the church, the world, and all in need. God of all grace, you are the source of life and joy. Strengthen the resolve of your church throughout the world. Protect and bless missionaries and their families. Embolden the leadership of younger churches. Awaken in us a commitment to the mission outreach of the church. God of grace, hear our prayer. God of all creation, you plant and nourish the earth as your own precious vineyard. We pray for the indigenous tribes of this continent who were the original stewards of this land and who continue to live among us. As a nation, forgive us for the way we have treated American Indians and grant that centuries of harm may be addressed by repentance, education, and understanding. God of grace, hear our, hear our prayer. prayer. God of all the earth, you desire peace and justice between nations and people. Bring peace to war-torn to war -torn countries, Ukraine, Sudan, and Haiti. Have compassion on refugees. Grant political leaders vision, integrity, compassion, and the ability to foster dialogue that serves the common good. God of grace, hear our prayer. God of the vineyard, we are saddened by the outbreak yet again of hostilities between Israel and Palestine. We ask you for leaders who realize conflict is not the answer and actively work to bring peace. Help our country to be a mediator. God of grace, hear our prayer. God of all steadfastness, you set Christ as the cornerstone and foundation of the church. Build up this congregation that it may stand as a witness to your faithfulness and love in this community. By your spirit, encourage and support our lay leaders. Bless the interim ministry of Pastor Eric Schaefer and prepare us to receive a new pastor according to your good and gracious time. God of grace, hear our prayer. God of all hope, in the meal of Holy Communion, you give us the bread of life. Unite us with all the saints and give us a taste of eternal life. Strengthen our trust in you through this heavenly food that we may be faithful workers in your vineyard until we join our voices with all the blessed in worship and praise. God of grace, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. Gracious God, into your hands we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your enduring, unending love and faithfulness. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always. And also with you. Let us share a sign of that peace with one another.
God of power, God of plenty, all things belong to you. We bring your gifts to the table that all might be fed. Form us into the body of your beloved, Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It, it is, is right, right to, to give, give our heart. thanks and praise. It is indeed right our duty and our joy that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ who on this day overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth, and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive, forgive us, us our trespasses, trespasses as, as we, we forgive those who trespass, trespass against us. And lead, lead us not into temptation, temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the, the kingdom, kingdom and the power and the glory, and the glory forever, forever and ever. ever. Amen. Jesus invites you to this table. Come, eat, and live. For our distribution today, we once again use intinction, beginning with the <coughs> left hand, uh, the transept and the left hand side, and then the right hand side. Uh, come forward, receive it in your hands, and then dip it into the red wine or the white grape juice. Uh, there's also gluten-free bread for those who need that. Uh, if you're receiving communion in the pew, uh, you receive it when you hear the words, the body of Christ for you, the blood of Christ shed for you, uh, you may have received it at that time. Please be seated.
the body of Christ for you.
Blessed be your name, O God, for we have tasted on your word, Christ Jesus, the joy and delight of our hearts. Strengthened by this food, send us to gather the world to your banquet, where none are left out and all are satisfied. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. The God of glory, Jesus Christ, the name above all names, and the Spirit who lives in you, bless you now and forever. Amen. Just a reminder that uh, those who are able are welcome to come to the uh, great room for a forum today with uh, representatives of the Mount Prospect Human Services Department. Now we conclude by singing our last hymn. Go in peace. God is at work in you. Thanks, Thanks be, be to, to God. God.